So to, tonight we're going to talk about CNC milling, which is lots and lots of fun. CNC milling is a great time. It is one of my favorite processes. And I think, I think the laser prior to Make Haven was my favorite process. Um, and now this totally has become my favorite process, the CNC. Same. Just because, just because of like how much can happen. And Ruby is uh, one of our local experts on CNC. She makes CNC art. And I don't know about expert, but <laughs> I make art. Yeah. And so we got lots of fun things to say and do tonight. And if we get the shot, we're going to go down and make a thing, which is a good time. We made a design already today, and I've got it pulled up somewhere. And we'll make another one. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we're going to try and live demo things for like doing the design work in here while we're in here. So here's the a rough, roughing, it's a CNC pun, a roughing plan, a rough plan. We're going to do the CNC overview, sort of big picture things. And then we're going to look specifically at the recommended software stack for the recommended machine. There are at least three CNCs in this space downstairs. But we really, really recommend that you just pick one of them. What's that? Oh, there's four. What's the fourth one? What the inverter, Tormac, and both know each other. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I was thinking about spinny end mills. We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then advanced. There's some other things that you can do, and some other stuff that can happen. And then what we hope you can do this week. So, big picture overview about the CNC. We're gonna try and do the highest level stuff first, just to give you a sense of what this is and where it's going. And uh, Ruby and anybody else who's got CNC experience, please ask questions, interrupt, uh, correct us if we're wrong. All, all of that is true so that we can we can have the best time. Uh, but that's a project I did on the Gerber a while ago. So we wanna start off with examples of what the CNC can do. Because oftentimes we bump into people who may not know what it can do. And so Ruby, you want to take us on a tour of some of these? Yes. So the CNC is capable of so many things. Um, I think when I first started learning like what the machine actually was, it was kind of difficult to uh, hold an understanding of like, okay, it does this, but what can it actually make? Um, so it can make a variety of things. A common project that lots of people take on is like, a full sheet of plywood and then they buy you know either some plans off of etsy or the internet that has a file ready to go uh to just like put together uh, a bunch of pieces together to, to to make like some sort of furniture um so that's common in the cnc world to make furniture off of just like one sheet of plywood uh, and a plan and a hope and a dream you know um they're great um another form like Folks make signage, folks make uh, Amer apparently like bald eagles and American like uh, signage is really popular. Um, not sure about that, but um, I love artsy stuff. So that's why I included a few like images of like these, this clock and like this lamp and um, this like reduction style like um, uh, chair in the center I don't know the correct I forget the right word for it but um it's, there, it's like some sort of style that you can tell is like CNC made but like it's also like I don't know that's probably one piece of wood oh yeah I would I would call a lot of these fall into the category of two and a half d where it's just a bunch of flat things that you build up yeah versus like the eagle which is really like 3D milling in mm -hmm. my mind. Like the tool had to do three-dimensional stuff to do that versus a lot of the rest. It can basically like the tool move, the, the spinny cutty bit moves up and down, but otherwise it just moves sideways. Right. And then Corey made this uh, table. You want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. That, that, so Ruby's, you can make it with a plan and a hope and a dream and a sheet of plywood. That's exactly what that was. Um, we had the big, and you, and you've all seen it downstairs. It's the, to hold the Wacom tablet and that tablet we got that individual piece of equipment, like when it was originally bought was somewhere in the eight grand ballpark and really deserves like a, a place to live. And so it was put on a coffee table, which is a great place because it's convenient and right in front of a chair. Um, but several of us wobbliest coffee table ever existed. <laughs> it was yeah. made by a Make Haven member. So okay, it was, I <laughs> it was great. Right. It was, it was no, but wobbly. you're totally right. It was wobbly. 
Um, and I'm sure it was good when it started, but the the idea was to give it something that was more appropriate to the device and to like house a computer and do all of that in one cart with one plug coming off the side. And so I was, I just asked Jared, like, we'll make Haven pay for the plywood if I have the fun of designing this and then we make it. Uh, and that's what happened. So it came out of one piece of plywood and there's some choices that I had to make in order for that to fit. But these are all examples of CNC stuff. Ruby's got some great examples that I'm sure we can look at and talk about, but maybe don't want to have on here because they're art and, you know, 2D image art is tricky to put up on the web. Um, it's, I mean, it's already on the web, but like we're in a time crunch. Don't yeah. worry. Okay. Don't worry All about right. me. All right. We'll get to it. Quick question about those chairs. Mm -hmm. how, how are they typically assembled? Wooden wheels, screws? Uh, yes. And a lot of the time they're press fit. I got a friend with a time yes. with a, with a two-year-old and they sell, um, CNC, somebody sells CNC chairs. They like have a few places where you just sort of assemble them together and they kind of click into place and then and then that's it. We love puzzles. Yeah, like puzzly chairs. Uh, that the idea with that particular chair is that as the kid gets taller, you can just adjust the chair and it works. It's, and it's real cute. Um, so what can a CNC actually cut? This is this is probably one of the reasons why I like a CNC the most. It's because you can cut all sorts of things. Plastic, metal, and wood are all on the menu. Um, however. There's a few constraints that we impose here because of our metal shop, wood shop architecture. And so um, in the wood shop, you can cut plastic and wood. And in the metal shop, you can cut metal. And although technically the Gerber or Shapoko would cut aluminum, we don't want you to do that because mixing the chips feels wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's basically it. Um, you have to handle metal chips as waste differently because they're a fire hazard and when around sawdust, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's ultimate. Chris <laughs> right, yeah, Chris doesn't want to have them intermingled so we can just make more. Um, but this is an example that I made actually for school and it was really helpful to see like you can just do the same process with different materials. In general, or as, as a broad statement, CNC means computer numerical control. And so that's ultimately the thing that links all of these. And officially, you can have a CNC that does many things. Like CNC embroidery is totally computer numerical control embroidery. But I, other than it's in the name, I would not put it in the same class as a CNC machine, which is like a subtractive manufacturing process. The CNC embroidery is totally a CNC machine. It's still computer numerically controlled, but it's got a sewing head. And so like, maybe it's my the way my brain works, but as I think about a CNC machine, I'm specifically thinking about spinning end mills. Mm -hmm. And that that's what, yeah. That's a great, it should be. What's like the if, question? Oh, why is the laser cutter not a CNC? Oh, okay. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ruby. A plus. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Uh, it's It absolutely is computer numerically controlled. The only reason why it wouldn't be a CNC machine is because of the end effector. And so it depends on how I, how much you want to build one of these machines. I've built, C, I've built a CNC handle maker before. Yeah. From hot wax, dipping things. It, you can build CNC just about anything. Um, that one was weird. It was just a vat of hot wax and it dipped a string in. It switched between two colors. So you could get colors in your, anyways, that's a side quest. But um, as long as you have a machine that moves around based on computer input, it's a CNC category machine. But when someone says, oh, I'm going to use a CNC, they often mean it mean a, a router. So it's not a universal, it's just sort of a category. Was this sort of thing, the or where this was mm -hmm. were those the first CNCs? I think they were some of the earliest ones. Um, there were CNC plotters probably before, because I think those were in the 50s. Mm. But these are super, super useful for manufacturers. Like you want to make car engines, you need a CNC. You want to make airplanes, you need a CNC. You want to make anything plastic, you probably need to make a mold out of metal, so you need a CNC to cut that. There's so, so, so many things in the world that pass through a CNC, that being a CNC machinist is a super valuable job. And like they run ads on the radio for we need CNC machinists in Connecticut. Um, it's totally like, and I, I tell the kids every new term, 
If you don't want to do school and you just want to get out as soon as possible, and make money, go do the six month training program and you can be a CNC machinist and make about six figures right away. So it's a really like, it's a totally a viable thing. And it means when you say that you mean this particular process, it usually doesn't mean the laser, although it could like one of those big ones at Logan steel where they're lasering through giant sheets of metal maybe, but um, typically it means something like this. And mm -hmm. often that means a CNC into metal. So closer to our torma. Um, but these are all different things. As you get started with them, you're going to start to interact with end mills and drill bits. And so these are really the end effector, the thing that does the work, um, that does the business is a end mill. And so it's a little tricky to try and draw it out. I've got the, this is the one that I carry around all the time. And I mean, I have a handful in my bag. Do you want to show the camera? I can show the camera. That's okay. a great, that's a great suggestion. Um, here's the, <laughs> Ruby, you're just, you're on it today. Thank um, you. Here's the CNC end mill. You can see it looks a lot like a drill bit. The thing is, is that they're, they're different in a lot of ways. Here's a whole bunch of them. We'll just pass them around. Uh, oh, oh, oh boy, sorry. It is, I apologize. <laughs> the difference between a drill bit and an end mill is that a drill bit is, is and they're, they're both like consumable things that go at the end of some tool in order to do a job. Drill bits are sharpened just at the tip and all the spiral bits are just there to move stuff away and not to like do any cutting. The spirals on a drill bit are just to get chips out of there. Whereas the end mill, the spirals are actually the cutting surface and the, the like tip is usually not even necessary. It's like kind of sharp. It's, it's sharp enough that it can clear things when it needs to, but in a metal CNC, you'd switch to a drill if you're gonna drill a hole. What are you determining the direction? Oh yeah, that's a down what? cut bit. What? Oh. Yeah, what's the question? Um, okay, so there's there's down cut and up cut. That's true. Down okay, so the spiral goes when you look at it like from the the not cutting end. I'm so the, glad you asked, Julia. The down cut is is going anti clockwise. So I'm assuming the up cut goes clockwise. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Here here on screen, I got the answer to that question. We'll pass these around. I prefer down cut and let me show you why these are all taken from a fantastic jonathan katz moses youtube video that you should absolutely go watch and i do not want to take credit um, for these things but they did high speed film of different types of end mills doing their thing and they're talking about them as router bits or maybe cnc stuff but here, if you're cutting into a sheet of plywood and all those chairs we saw were flat things being cut very much like the material being cut here, you can have different types of bits. The straight bits were, are the oldest, they're the cheapest, they're the easiest to make. Um, and then there's the upcut and downcut bits. All of the Make Haven owned bits downstairs, they're all upcut because it's often the thing you want to do if you're cutting into metal. The metal will be removed, it's pulled away, the metal is, is pulled off and there's no fibers in the metal. So you don't have to worry about weird fibrous effects. If you're doing it for wood, you may want to switch to a down cut bit because of the way that it moves. And so if you look at the three pieces of wood specifically on these, the straight bit has got a lot of material chatter. Everything's sort of shaken around a lot and it can lead to a louder machine running and it can lead to weird effects on the cut. The finish may not be as good. There's a lot of trickiness to that. The upcut, if you think about the cutting surface, and this is sort of like thinking about how the heck does a lawnmower do any cutting? It's got a blade that comes slicing along and it slices and sort of pulls it upward. And as it does that, if there's fibers at the top, you can see they sort of build up right here and they don't necessarily get cut off. You'd have a better bottom finish because if, it's a, if it cuts all the way to the bottom and it pulls it up, it slices it sort of against the bottom of the material going going upward and then it's fine but it doesn't look as good on the top surface which is usually the one in a woodworking project you want to look at so i like the down cut bits because you get the same material stability like it's not shaking like crazy like the straight bit but because the curve is sort of pushing the wood downward at the same time as it's cutting you don't get those end fray effects that make it really nice what's that so is it every time that the straight bit has to prepare uh sometimes if you just oh, what was the question yeah <laughs> um, is there ever a time when the straight bit is preferred 
I would say, yes, they're cheaper. We have them, you can use them for free. And if you're really trying to hog out a lot of material, it, it's probably like pull out a lot of material. Sorry, I'm from the Midwest. <laughs> um, if you're really trying to pull out a lot of material, you may want to, you could use one of those. Yeah. I have uh, a question. I heard somewhere somehow that uh, a down cut bit like could more likely catch on fire because of like the material. Oh, that's is it jammed? That's true. Yeah, it is packing the material. So the you see on the middle one, the chips are sort of flying up out of there, right? As this gif is rolling. And they that the upcut bit does a great job with that. It moves all the material away. It's another reason why they're almost exclusively used in metalworking, because your chips are where the heat is and you want to get all the heat away from the piece you're working on. A downcut bit doesn't do that. And it can pack the material down, the, it can pack the sawdust down into your cut, which can be a problem if you don't have good vacuum or if you're like, if it's really deep or really crazy. I have never run into an issue. And I've even heard people say they prefer down cuts because then you, the sawdust will stabilize your piece as you finish your cut. The down cut has a lot less cleanup. And so that is where I find the value in the down cut is that there's a lot less cleanup and all the, the yeah. Thanks. Sorry. I'm not good at repeating questions. I got it. Don't worry. <laughs> Thanks, Ruby. Uh, and so that that is the down cut is a lot less cleanup. And that's why I like them. Um, that said, there are almost unlimited types of end mills. So we just looked at the three most common, but there's really an unbelievable repertoire of tool library you can have. The most common ones or like the, the most common end mills. I've got underlined here, square coated, tool steel, up cut, quarter inch, two flute, end mills are what you're most likely to find downstairs. But like, here's McMaster, look at all these variations. Here's a bunch of these in different sizes and there's different properties like this shiny part is the shank. Then here's the cutting area. Um, here's a compression bit where you can get that's a combination of down and up cut at the same time. Those cost more, they're great. They're also tricky to use. Your first cut needs to be in far enough that you're past the up bit. But then if you do cut through, you get the perfect cut on both sides. Mm -hmm. They're like, I, I don't know. I've it's never. Bougie. Like, yeah, they're super. <laughs> they are. Like you can, those bits sometimes are 200 bucks. Wow. Yeah. I I don't spend that much on my animals is really ultimately why I'm not good at a compression bit. Um, they are consumables and $200 consumable makes me cry a little inside. So. Um, I can see if I was making like really high end. Oh yeah. Stuff that I was selling, then like yeah, I could see if they weren't. If you're a cabinet have, maker, mm -hmm. yeah, and you don't need to do any cleanup, and like it'll probably last you for the week, and then you're gonna buy a new one anyways. I would do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's the video. You should totally go watch that video. Those gifts are from a nineteen thousand frames per second recording of those tools running. It's really cool. Um. So you can buy all the versions that you want. And we're going to look at some examples where buying a different version does actually help. But now it's good to think about when you're talking about CNC machines, why the heck do we have three? And it boils down to they have different properties and different limitations that you may want to take into consideration. So um, one of the things that you think about with your machine is how rigid is it? There's the Shapoko is the one that we're going to recommend for everybody. And it's it's not like a shaky pile of mess. And I can show you a CNC that I built that is that. Um, but it is not the sturdiest. The Gerber is much, much stronger. It's the big one downstairs. And just by sheer bulk, they often, they make them physically larger so they're more stable. Um, and the Tormach is like an adorable little metal machinist tool. But the large CNC machinist tools, you can like walk inside of. They, they may, they're many tons. Um, Lior really wants to get one and put it in the room next to this. Yeah. And so if that's true, then you can just like put a, a 50 pound chunk of steel in and it'll just go to town cutting right through it like it's butter. Um, I've seen those. They're, they're almost scary, <laughs> like in just how they operate. Uh, Joel, the... Oh yeah, Joel, Joel has one. Joel works at, at Yale something or other and has, yeah, just... It's incredible. I mean, it's bigger than my first apartment. Yeah. It has an automatic tool changer that like is 
it yeah it's automatic tool changer happens so fast it would just like it i don't it's <laughs> unbelievable um another thing you really think about is your machine machine size the tormach is less than 12 inches and I, I think it's more like eight inches the shapoko is 30 inches um side by side for the two horizontals and maybe three in the vertical and the gerber is four feet by eight feet by i'm going to go with eight inches so it's a much, much larger volume. That's the one I made the furniture on. You can put a whole sheet of plywood on it. It just goes. Um, there are many schools. If, I mean, no one in here is going to buy one, but you can buy a shop bot for $40,000 that is the size of the Gerber. The Gerber is a higher quality version than a, than a shop bot. Sorry, shop bot. But it is, but it is a machine that will cover that large area. That, so that has value. Another thing that's really important to think about is what's the barrier to entry. And the reason why we're putting the carbide 3D suggestion out is that it's very low barrier to entry. We're going to make a design in here together while we're all in the room. And then we're going to go downstairs and actually cut it as long as no one's in our way running the machine. So um, those, are, those are the plans. Then I think if I were to list out the barrier to entry, the Tormax actually slightly easier than the Gruber is to run, but it's not the easier one to get a badge for. So in any case, we really are going to recommend everybody try the Shapoko for this week and don't, don't go nuts with anything else. Um, so and as, while we're talking here about machine limitations, if you get into further CNC design, you're going to want to Google dog bones because none of the, some limitations are like how much does the machine shake its tool and the fact that no CNC machine can cut a square inside corner. So sometimes you have to do weird things like overcut those corners. Those are called dog bones and we can talk about them a lot. But let's focus on what we can do instead of limitations. So first up, it's carbide 3D and the Shapoko. Here, here it is, and I've got it loaded on my, I've got it on the wrong screen of my laptop. Here is carbide create. So this is carbide create. It's this lovely little software. You can see there's not many buttons. It's doing just fine. Um, when you open it, I've got the width of the materials 10 inches, the height is 10 inches, and the material is a half an inch thick. Um, I've got an origin that's referencing the top. You can also have it reference the bottom of the material. And then a few other things that we have the center in the in is the origin point. This looks so friendly. I'm so excited. It's really, really great. Um, this software is so good that it's the CNC brand that we bought for the school because it's approachable. Um, two days ago, I made a design and from concept to thing in my hand was 11 minutes. And I had a kid last Wednesday who walked up and said, is that the CNC machine? And a half an hour later, the kid had made a design and we had cut it out for him. So there's, these machines are very, very approachable, um, which is really, really nice. So carbide create is one half and carbide motion is the other. We'll see that those two are very much related as we take a look at what's going on. And they all come from this one California-based company, Carbide 3D. Not that they're the end-all be-all of CNC. They're just the most approachable and what we have downstairs. So Carbide Create is available for Mac and PC. You can go get it um, online here. It's a very nice, easy download. So it's a, it's a perfectly good thing to do. It is an all-in-one solution generally, but you can go well beyond it. So it does not limit you from what you're able to do but it's a great starting point for lots and lots of projects. I'd say probably, honestly, like 85% of what people do at Make Haven would be totally, you would never need to go beyond Carbide Create. Just if you're starting to get real weird, well, you need to go past it. So this is the base interface. This is what we just had pulled up. Um, and we're gonna take a look at it in a minute. We can look at it live, but this is what you get. There's the setup, a create vector and an import in these different areas here. This is your big drawing area. Um, in general, you've got your shapes. Here's how you manipulate your shapes. Once you've got a shape selected, you can see if you, it's another contextual menu. So once you click on a shape, this has changed over here. If I want to edit or create shapes, I can do it here. If I want to like horizontally or vertically flip, I can do that. This is to move things or to scale things or make patterns rectangular or circular. And if you want to add tabs, we'll talk about tabs a bit. Um, these are how you can hold things down as you're cutting. Although most of the time you don't need to think about that for a, a while. 
And then these are node edit tools. So if you're really like, you're, you're so in love with Inkscape, you can't stop thinking about nodes. Um, if that's the case, you may want to edit your nodes here and you do it with this tool. Um, ultimately, we're going to think about sort of CAD and CAM. These are kind of separate processes that get handled all inside of Carbide Create. In other software stacks, you have to separate them out. The CAD is where you make your design. And so that's where the Fusion 360 or Onshape or Tinkercad, that's where those all live. And everything we looked at, the CAD is fairly simple in Carbide Create, but it's very, very able to do anything that's basically 2D. Um, then the CAM is something that's, that's, that's all new to us. So CAM is computer-aided machining. And this is where you start making choices about how the machine's going to make the thing you want to make. Uh, and then ultimately that makes G-code, but delightfully, you don't have to think about the G-code at all in this software stack. You can look at it, but you don't even need to touch it. So that's that's the best. Um, all you need to do to get to the toolpaths part is just click on this other tab over here. And then you can start making choices about how it's going to make your things. Like in here, I have two toolpaths set up, one to cut out, to deepen, to make a pocket for the letters where they're sort of cut down and another one to do the cutout. And I think I have, and, and I can show you how this works in just a second. You can do previews and here's your general toolpath interface. If I've got this, let me import in the Make Haven sticker. So we made this downstairs, a lot of us, and I'm going to scale this thing up so that it's, I don't know, nine inches wide. Did you just import an SVG file? I sure did. Did I just what? import an SVG? Thanks, you, Ruby. Yeah, no, you got it. You did that. Uh, and yes, I sure did. This is the same one that we used to make the stickers from the vinyl. from for the vinyl plotter. And so these are the same exact things. Uh, if I wanted to make this, there's a few different ways that you could do this. And I'm going to delete this thing. I may want to take this design and do a pocket. And that'll make sense when you see it in just a second. A pocket is going to cut a quarter or an eighth of an inch deep into the material that I'm using here. And this is a pocket toolpath. The blue lines are where it's going to actually physically move the tool around. And so it'll spin and cut and do all the things in those blue line areas. And I'm just going to hit OK for the sake of clarity. This is 26 minutes, and I'll have my little thing. That is, we'll talk about that in a bit but you can even see a simulation of what this is gonna look like and it'll show you just like that. So that's this is the power of what's going on, but we're gonna take a look at some of the details of that because there's, there's stuff that we can alter. So up here in toolpaths, this is where you can set them up. Here is where you'll see a list of all the ones that you've designed. And this is if you wanna look at your preview, you can do that here. The actual preview view looks like this and there's some important things to look at. Um, the toolpaths are the green lines in this setup. So that's where your tool is going to move around and do the cutting. And the fast travel is the red that will be motions that it takes that aren't intended to be cutting material because it thinks it's going to be above the material. Also, that's what Fusion 360 limits if you're on the hobby license. It just says, we'll do those, but slowly. So that if you're a business, you lose time. Um, and so in here, if you look really closely, you can see they do sort of progressively deeper passes to cut the thing free from the border. And that is really helpful. Um, you, that's what? a, yeah. Do you need oh, a sac Do you need a sacrificial piece of material below it to cut all the way through? You sure do. Every CNC <laughs> bed has something sacrificial there. Ours are MDF and it's permanently installed. You don't need to worry about it. Um, try not to gouge into it if you can. But ultimately, Lior is going to come around and replace them every so often. Um, although it'd be really nice if we just let him, if we just let them live for a long time so he doesn't have to do it constantly. Um, so those are the, those are different things that you want to look at. Looking at your preview is not a required step, but it's very helpful if you want to see sort of how it's going and make predictions before you go in and just hit go, because it'll give you a sense of what's going to happen. Um, also, there's a big design library. Or let's let's take another look at the carbide create here. There's a few things that are interesting limitations. And these are things that you pick up over time. If you'll notice, this looks different than the stickers that we made. That H is sort of a traditional H. 
And in the design, it's got these weird funky cutouts that make it look make haven-y. Um, the reason why it looks like this is because the tool just can't get in there. We're doing our cut with a quarter inch end mill and that's just not a quarter inch gap. And so it can't physically fit in that space. So there's some limitations on this tooling and you can, you can do better. So there's a few ways that you could solve this. I could switch from a quarter inch end mill to here's your list. So I can choose my tools by going into the tool selection. Uh, if I go into, let's say it's a hardwood end mills and I choose an eighth inch bit, I can do that. I'm gonna hit select and okay, and just okay. And sort of work my way through. It's recalculating. You can see it makes it in, but I'm at 91 minutes. Yeah, what's up? Is it possible to change the drill bits midway? That's a great question. Is it possible to change the drill bits midway? Uh, it sure is. And thanks for everybody helping. <laughs> um, the reason why this one takes so long is because it's only an eighth of an inch everywhere. The best, if I were to wave a wand and say, here's the best way to do it, I would completely ditch the pocket. Um, and so I'm going to delete this toolpath entirely and use an advanced V-carve toolpath using this selection. So this has an area pocket tool. So it'll clean out all the area. And I'm going to use a, a larger quarter inch bit. So in my end mills, you can choose a quarter inch. I like the 205. And so I'll select this one. And that's going to use a quarter inch to clear out most of it. And then it'll switch over to a V bit, which is a pointy bit. Its diameter changes as you get closer and closer to the tip. And so it can choose to put that very low in the workpiece or keep it very high. So it's got a very thin diameter. And that is really helpful for getting all your detail. Let me show you what that turns into. So we do this calculation, 30 minutes. I can definitely make it go faster. But see, all this looks pretty much the same. But in here, you start to see this V stuff happening. And so it's taking the V bit and it's going down and in and getting in those tiny, tiny corners that otherwise are really hard to get to. If we take a look at the simulation, all of that takes a little longer. It's a little more complicated cut, but there's the detail that you're hoping for. And the V bit is, it puts a little taper on the edges, which some people really like actually. And because it can go to just the very tip of the spinny V bit, you can get very fine, sharp corners on things. And lots and lots and lots of businesses have exactly this kind of signage out front. You've probably seen a painted wood sign with like a groove for the letters, probably with gold leaf on it in front of a funeral home or a bougie neighborhood or a, or a fancy pizza shop. There's, some, there's definitely signs like this around that you've seen in life. Um, this is specifically a V-carve style. Uh, and it's such a popular style that there's an entire software called V-carve that we're going to talk about in a minute. Love V-carve. Yeah, it's named for this, for this one effect. Um, but in, in here, we've got our whole thing. It's all set up. You can do just a single tool path or somewhere in here. I'm going to try and open the one that we designed downstairs. You just discard all of this. Uh, and let's go to Ashley's mess. Here's, here's this. So here's, here's one we played with earlier. Uh, you can see there's lots of things going on here. And in, in, instead of, well, so the reason why we picked this font is it's super, there's no sharp edges, right? So it's you, fun. You, it's fun. It's a fun font, but it also doesn't have the problem of, of corners. It's going in my garage. Yeah. It's a, it's okay. a garage sign. Yep. Um, but you can see it's going on here. It, as you get better, and this is not your first rodeo, do you do this? As you get better, you can adjust settings for these cuts. So like in here, you can dial in the plunge rate and the feed rate to be what you want. These are way higher than the defaults, but I know the machine will cut well in the wood that we're gonna cut because I've done it before. You just get better, you do some research, you find out what you want these settings to be, and your times can go from 30 minutes down to five minutes. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. What happens if if you go too fast or too slow? What can uh, happen? That's that is a good question. Um, so or is that after? No, 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 no. Okay. We should we should do it. Um, and you've got some experience that goes along. If you go too slow, you get like really powdery sawdust. Like it looks like a fine powder instead of chips. You want chips um, to be cut off, and it rubs a lot. So the tool, the cutting end mill gets hot and it goes bad faster. And so you don't really want that. Um, and the reason you can tell it's going too slow 
if it's doing all that rubbing and when it's done, you should wait till it's fully stopped spinning. You put your finger on it. If it's burning hot, burning hot, it's you were going too slow. If you go too fast, you risk your bit sliding out or chipping or even snapping a bit. They're really hard, but they're also brittle. Mm -hmm. And if that happens and you probably wasted the bit and your workpiece, um, or if you really hear the motor straining to make, to hit the speed that you're asking them to. So listening to a CNC machine as you get better and better is a very important skill because it's often happening too fast to see it, but you can hear it because it also is conveniently in the audible range. So it's a fun, it's, it's a skill that you build. Like if someone's running the Gerber downstairs and I'm walking down the stairs into the space, I can tell when it's turning a corner because I'm listening to it as I walk down the stairs. It's, you get better from listening to it. Um, what were Ashley's like three different oh, tool paths? That's a good question. What um, was the question? What were the three different tool paths? We can see them highlighted here in red. This is one of the advanced V carves. So this is going to be using the V bit to cut all of the sparkles. And it uses an eighth inch clearing bit to clear out the large area of the unicorn. So wherever the eighth inch bit will fit, it uses that to clean out most of the volume of the unicorn, but then the V-bit for all of the sparkles. What the, about the edge beam one? Is that the V-bit too, like detail? Uh, no, actually, if you zoom in real close, the V-bit just goes out to the edge of the horn of the unicorn and comes back in. And we can't super, let me go to the simulation, see if it'll show it, but it changes the depth of it as well. So it's going, it's, it's not as deep when it gets to the end of the horn. So that just the tip of the bit is in it. And maybe. There's so much going on at the nose of the. At the nose of the unit, of the what? nose of it? Yeah. That's a good question. What was the question? Uh, why is there so much going on at the nose? It's because the eighth inch end mill can't fit there. So the, the very small tip of the V bit has to do all that clearing. So it has to go back and forth a lot. Um, so it, it's, there's so much happening there for that reason. And maybe I can rotate this. Um, but in, if I can nail it just right, sort of the depth of the V bit is changing as it goes out. And so in any of these areas, the, the, it's moving in all three dimensions at once to the side in both directions and up for that V bit. Yeah. The green line indicates the depth as well. Like a map. To the shank? It's, it's the, to, the... to the tip, to the center of the tip of the bit. So yeah. is the is the you know real life process mm -hmm. like it starts with the first tool path and then it turns to that and then it stops and yeah kind of beats at you to change its bit yes so the question is in real life how's this going to go and um your assumption was correct you start off with the bit to clear out most of the unicorn and it'll, then it will pause and say hey I'm done I'm ready for this next tool and then you switch out to that next tool it keeps all of its reference frame. It'll measure how long that new tool is. And then it goes and does all of the stuff with that tool. And then it, it goes and does the next one. As you get more advanced, and it sounds like we're asking good questions, people are gonna get advanced quick, that's exciting. Um, you may choose an order of operations that minimizes your tool changes. So like if you use the quarter inch bit a lot and the V bit a lot, maybe you just choose to put them in the order of all the quarter inch bit stuff first and then all the V bit stuff second. Um, or if you're going to use it, like we sort of break this free on the sides um, and we use tabs to hold it together, you probably want to do all of the de design stuff in the middle first and then do the cutout. So it's really solid for all of the design work. And then only at the end do you cut it. So it's just held by those little flimsy tabs. So that should like, and we put that last, right? This is our, our last step is the cutout. Um, so thinking about order of operations is something that as you get more advanced, you start to do more, um, but you can avoid it if you want to at the beginning and you get it wrong and it's kind of fun and funny. This is a good example of expect your first one to go poorly. Don't like buy, don't put the expensive purple heart in for round one with the Shifoko. Wait for later. Get good with just like crap, scrap wood you find in the back. Um, and then you'll get more confident. Um, so let's let's say hypothetically you're not as creative as we were inspired to be downstairs. <laughs> you can download many designs straight from Carbide Create. So they have lots and lots of options. You can get states in usually a simple and a complicated. Colorado. Yeah, Colorado is <laughs> just a rectangle, but you know it's fine. 
Uh, their teddy bears are a little jarring. Some of these are better than others, but they are all there. These are yeah. just vectors. They do not have tool pass with them. So you can make all those choices that you want once you have them. Um, it, like in order to get the unicorn, we couldn't find one that we liked. So I li we literally just did it with Inkscape. Like here it was from Inkscape. We found it online, turned it into vectors, and that was it. Can you manipulate the vectors and carbide of the preset designs? Uh, yes. Can you can you manipulate the vectors and carbide? Short answer is yes. Long answer is don't do it. Inkscape's better. Um, save the vector. Find a different way to get the vector. It's it can. It's not fun. Um, do your design work like that in Inkscape first, and then import it, and it works much better. Um, the tool library is big. You can add custom tools. You probably won't um, on the machine downstairs, but on your own laptop, if you are nerdy enough to carry around your own end mills like I do, you may want to add your own tools. So you know, this is the tool that I'm going to use. And this is, and you can put your own name. You can give them their own properties. You can set in your own feed rate and cut depth and RPMs for the tools that you know you have. Um, they all come with numbers. These numbers are arbitrary. But a machine shop with an auto bit changer is definitely going to number their tools. So they know exactly what tool it is. They know how long it's run. They know what its diameter really is because they measured it twice. Like all of those things would be used by somebody who's trying to crank out woodworking projects for business. For us, you know, you can just sort of edit these on the fly and it's fine. Um, also post processors, you will not bump into this for a long time. But if you wanted to design anywhere but Carbide Create, you can get the post processors for the Shipoko and use them in Fusion 360 or VCarve or other places. So those are all possible things to do. Um, if you want to, if you if you find yourself wanting to move beyond Carbide Create, the best way to do that is to get started with VCarve using the post processor for the Shipoko. So you can change your software or your machine one at a time. If you try and do both software and machine change at the same time, it gets it gets scary. So just stick to one change at a time. Like maybe you do Shipoko three or four projects, and then you switch over to, okay, instead of doing it in Carbide Create, I want to design it in VCarve, which we're going to talk about in a second, which is another software. And then you still make it on the Shipoko. So like there's some familiarity as you build that skill set. Um, and then the VCarve, the VCarve can work for all of our CNCs, uh, except the embroidery. It works for the Tormach, the Gerber, and the Shapoko. And we have a class on the V card. And we do. Uh, yeah, that's very well loved because it's it is a quirky software, um, but really powerful. Carbide Motion is this is the sibling to Carbide Create. This one is just there to drive the tool around, and it will accept .c2d files that come right out of Carbide Create or directly accept G-code from other platforms, which is really, really helpful that they left that open and didn't lock you into just their stack. Um, they also have a pro version of Carbide Create. I don't think I would recommend it. I would instead use the Makerspace version of eCarb that we have here. Um, Can I ask why? Oh, yeah. Because um, the Makerspace vCarve we have is free. True. Um, and if you learn that, you can also run all the machines. So. It, it's mostly that, like no love lost to Carbide 3D, but I am i don't feel like I need to just learn their software stack. Um, if VCarve wasn't free, I think I would say the better value proposition is Carbide Create Pro, mm. but that's a different discussion. Okay. Um, so Carbide Motion, I don't have installed, but this is what it looks like. It's very much a simpler thing. This gives you the position of the cutter at all times and a few simple buttons. This software is great. Don't ever try to outsmart it. It knows what it's doing and just follow along. Um, the first thing you do is you turn it on and you initialize the machine. So it finds its home. Every time a CNC machine turns on, it's lost and doesn't know where it is in the universe. It needs to initialize and go find its two home buttons, three home buttons to know where the tool is. It's just a process. You wait a few minutes and it's fine. Can you imagine having an existential crisis? Does that work? Yes. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah that's I rescind my question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it will it will prompt you in Carbide Motion a tool change is required. Please insert a tool. Um, follow those instructions. If you don't, one common thing that happens it presses a button, which is kind of funny. Uh, 
Carba, in order to measure the length of the tool, because they, they may be different lengths when you install them, it has to measure how long the tool is in order for it to function correctly. If you try and outsmart the machine or you just get excited and you press buttons fast, you may send it to that button while the end mill's spinning and then it will drill a hole in the button. Please don't do that. It has happened many times. It's <laughs> filled with epoxy. It's, yeah, just, just, just follow the instructions. It's fine. The robot needs to touch the button while it's not spinning. Who doesn't want to push a button? I, yeah, even robots. But um, follow the instructions, it'll be fine. If there's already a tool and it just says this command, you probably will walk up. And this is when it does initializing, it wants a tool to be present. Any tool at all, or even there's, there's a blank they give you that's just a, a rod of metal. Those all work fine. It's just going through its setup operation. So. How long does it take? Um, less than three minutes. So it's fine. How long does it take? Is less than three minutes. Um, it's what it's doing in that time period is it's trying to figure out lots of different reference frames. As you get deeper into G code, you'll start to understand that there's a machine home, there's the work home, there's tool offsets. Carbide Create manages all of this for you, so you don't have to think about it. Um, one thing you will have to think about is the top and bottom reference frame for your designs. So like in here, if we go back over to Ashley's mess mm -hmm. and we take a look at this, it's very important that we know it's top referenced and that we know it's referenced from the middle of the board. We're gonna actually physically cut it out of this board. So when we put it in, we wanna set it in the machine and we're going to reference the tool by moving it exactly to that location. And so we'll talk about that in a second but you wanna know where that place is in 3D space so that you can put the tool there and it will cut in the right spot relative to where you want it to. Um, yeah. And so this is, there's lots of fun. You can do a whole lot of things. Sometimes tool paths get really crazy and it's a great time. So that is one that I imported and cut on the old Chipoko. I'm very glad it was fine. I'm very glad we have a new Chipoko. Uh, in order for, you've got all those forces happening. And so this is Ruby holding down a workpiece. You can use double stick tape sometimes. You can use different things, different times on the Gerber. Sometimes I'll screw down a piece of plywood to the machine bed. Um, and that's perfectly fine if you know exactly what you're doing with those screws. But this is best done with little clamps. And so these little clamps like this are real important. And you will absolutely run into one with the tool when you're a beginner. Just be ready for it. It's why they're often made out of soft materials. Like this plastic, I think is what they came with. Somebody bought the upgraded clamps here and they just left them, which is very nice, but they're all metal. They're aluminum, so soft metal, but they're all metal. So you hit them and you have a problem. So this one, this shiny part, somebody fully just drove right across it. And so that's what that is in that clamp. Somebody just, just nailed it real, real well. Um, you can also see the MDF underneath. That's the sacrificial bed. And so that's there. Um, and these are all of the marks of fun things that people have made in the past. So in a perfect world, you would just kiss the bottom and not go into it at all. Just enough that like you make it all the way through. But most of the time we do a bad job of estimating the if you're doing through cuts and you can change your reference to be the material bottom, that's the best way to avoid cutting into the bed. So like in the case of Ashley's design here, we could do the first two tool paths, top referenced, and then stop, save the file and change it to bottom referenced for the cutout so that we re-zero to the base of the bed. It means we're less likely to dig into the bottom. Does it re-zero the bed each time? you would need to manually, re does it re-zero the bed each time? You would need to manually re-zero it as well. Um, the reason you do that is just to save your waste board and to be a good community member. Um, and the reason that it could be a problem is I just guessed that our material is half an inch. If it's really 0.45, that's five hundredths that you're going into the bed. Or, you know, if you're, if you're guessing your height of this, you, you're more likely to land where you don't think you're going to land. No, point of the thing, let's um, Okay, so one of the things I would like to use it for is for enlargement of 3D. 
files. Sure. Which means we're talking about like the layer cake approach, cutting out of foam. Yeah. Very light. Yep. Moves a lot. Yep. Um, how do you manage that? Do you glue it down to something? Yeah, you can. Um, or and in, clamping just on the edges isn't going to do it, I don't think. No, and actually, if you're talking about very, very large things, I would do it one on the Gerber because it's very large. And now you're talking the inch and a half thick stuff you get from Lowe's. Mm -hmm. I would figure out where my design is in that and I would put screws through the inch and a half. So they're like a two inch through. Yeah, with fender washers. Mm -hmm. And then I would also sink a screw in the middle of the piece because you will never see it on the outside, but it keeps it solid. Tab, yeah, tabs are fine, but they're often not strong enough when you get to real flimsy versus real large. And so managing that is something you get better at with skill and thinking specifically about your materials. In wood and metal, a little tab is usually great. Foam, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A couple of screws in the middle of your four foot wide thing, totally fine. Um, but clamps like this is how everybody will start. Ultimately, what you you don't need to like clamp it down until the end of time, but you do need to clamp it down enough so that when it's sitting there and you try pretty hard to shake it, it doesn't move. The table should be moving first, not the piece. So when I am like checking to see if it's working, this table's sturdy. It's not like a it's not a rickety coffee table. But when you push on it. I want the piece to stay still relative to the machine and the machine to move, the, the table to move. That's the right amount of clamping, um, which is probably less than you think, but it still needs to be strong. Because if the whole thing moves, you wreck your piece and that's when you're most likely to break a bit. So um, how do you set your home? You use the jog menu. You can drive the thing around by hand, which is really fun the first several times. Uh, you use the arrow keys and page up, page down. You drive it around until it gets to the place you want it to be. Um, this increment over here tells you how fast it's going to go. Fast is just like it moves continuously. If you click it down a number, it goes one millimeter at a time. And so when you press the up arrow, it moves forward one millimeter. And, that, and that's great when you're getting like close to your target. You want to go down to slower speeds. Um, it'll go down. I, mine, I just leave in millimeters. And it'll go down to... 0 0.0025 millimeters. So very precise. Um, if you're going to manually home the machine, and this is how I do it, um, although it's not necessarily the smart move, it's just the one I do, you need to know where your orientation is and you move the tool around until you know where you're physically at the right spot on your piece. And then you just hit zero all and that's it. So it's very nice and straightforward. It's clear. I don't ever feel like I'm going to get tricked by it. And I think that's why I like it the most. It's so dead simple. As long as I know where my origin is on the design and I know where the tool is, it's fine. Um, if you want, you can use this automatic probe and that's great. Um, I have more than once been surprised where it goes afterwards. And I'm sure that's a me thing, not a probe thing, but I would just advise you watch a couple training videos on specifically this. I'm not qualified to give you information on it. Um, but it means you usually want to put it, uh, it has weird ledges on the bottom. So this is usually likes to live on the corner of a thing. So you need a corner on your workpiece or on your material. So it, that's, a, that's a factor. This is neat though. It uses, it conducts electricity through the tool in order to tell when it's hit the surface and it knows exactly how thick that thing is. Um, like it knows exactly how thick it is. That piece is $120. It knows how thick it is. And just for sheerly the like precision to which they know its thickness. Um, Cause it's just a chunk of aluminum. Um, but this works great. If you really needed to find a center or other features, it, it can be really helpful. Um, when you import into carbide motion, you're gonna get this sort of a view, and that's fine. You just say done, which is a button that I've covered up. It's this done. You can also look at the ISO view of your G-code. You can see the tabs that were in this design. And then here's the actual G-code itself. If you want, you can learn to read and write G-code. It's a Turing complete language. You could write computer programs in it. Uh, uh, starts with a J. Joel, Joel totally has. He's written computer programs yes. in, in G-code. Don't is the advice I've got, <laughs> just, just don't. Um, but it can be helpful if you're getting to the Gerber level and you've been doing it a lot to have a few of these commands in your brain. 
that is years down the line for everybody in the room, even me. Um, running the job. So then you get to like, there's a button all the way back here that is um, load new file and then there's start job. When you get to there, this menu pops up. And so it'll say start and it brings you to this view. It's not directly gonna start the machine. And then you can click start again and it goes. You can adjust the feed rate if you find it's going too slow. Like if you're worried, if, if it doesn't sound right, you can speed it up to 200% of its original design and you can speed it down in 10% increments down to just about zero. So it's always good to overshoot your speed a little because you can adjust down, but there's a max limit to how much you can go up. So I like to overshoot and you can bring it down if it sounds like the machine's going crazy, which is fine. Um, and you will start to learn to hear it. And then it just has a progress bar. That's really actually very helpful. Do you do like a, you know, like a, the laser with the lid open? Mm -hmm. They pass to see just where- Oh, you like can. Quick... I do, I call that cutting air. It's the thing I didn't include here some for some reason. But if you are worried about it fitting on your workpiece, you can just set the Z falsely above it and see where it goes if you wanted to do that. Um, and usually I'll run the cutout pass with that because that's the one where it matters, like where, where are the edges of the piece. Um, also, there's so much precision in these machines, you could make circuit boards if you wanted. And so that's a really cool thing. You can I've done it on a CNC, not this CNC before, but you can do it on CNC machines. Um, here's a circuit board that I designed and made on a, on a Roland M40A something. And then here's, uh, this is an Arduino brain, soldered onto one. Flat cam has made this marvelously easier than it used to be. And Carbide Create even has their own proprietary Carbide Popper. So if you're already way into designing circuit boards, you can totally make them on any of our CNC machines. Mike, it looks like there's a question about to happen. <laughs> okay, all right. I have material for this. I have FR4 board at school to try and do one of these before the end of the school year. So we'll see. Although I'm always optimistic about doing that project. I've been thinking I'm gonna do it here for three years, so <laughs> probably won't happen. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, so G-code and post-processors. If you wanted to learn G-code, and again, don't, there are plenty of there are plenty of cheat sheets. So just look up the cheat sheet for like G0 is a rapid motion, G1 is a straight feed, is a is a normal motion. If you really got sick of something and you're doing fusion and you wanted to meticulously read the G code, you could put in G0s. Honestly, Project Lead the Way, which is a program for teaching high schoolers how to do this, they do teach kids G code. And it's a little, it blows my mind every time. Um there are post processors for each machine. The Gerber uses Linux CNC EMC2. Carbide 3D has its own. Pathpilot is what we use for the Tormach. And these are all different softwares that you have to use in different machines. However, it's worth it when the payoff is the thing you need. Um, and so you, you learn it when you have to. Um, Bcarve is how you'd set up for all the different machines. And so this is the other software stack. This you can get for free. There's a Makerspace edition. And it is Windows only, which is very sad. Sorry, all of you Apple people. Boo. I know. But this is VCarve is named VCarve because of its namesake toolpath structure, VCarves. This is all of those signs you've ever seen. They were probably designed with an Aspire VCarve product. Um, and it works great. You can add in a bunch of features. You do a bunch of things. We're going to quickly, quickly, quickly tear through the interface in case the entire time you've been bored. This is for those people who really are ready for VCar. Um, but just sort of like we did with Fusion last week, this can be a lot. So just sort of look at it. And if you're not going to hop in, which is reasonable, just sort of see, oh, these are analogous tools that exist in the next software up. So um, surface ref reference or machine reference, same, same deal as setting up a job in Carbide Create. These are your create vectors. Here's your transform vectors. And here's editing things. These are, the reason why this software is hard is because there's no words anywhere. There's just pictures and you're supposed to guess at what all the pictures mean. Like in what universe does this look like rotate? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it just, there are tool tips, but you have to wait and hover every time. And it's fine. You learn it quickly, but it's just slow going. I mean, once you tell me it's rotate, I can see. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I still can't see, but. <laughs> it was. 
vertical. It was horizontal. Now it's vertical. Yeah, what's that? I don't know what the bird, the bird thing, thing is. What is it? You want I, a bird? <laughs> yeah, it's too many. Shit, there's what a bird. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the Portland button. I think this is like, I think this is trace a picture that you bring in, no, like no. trace bitmap. Like, put a bird on no. it. Yeah, it's just. No, trace, trace bitmap is. um. It's just birds. Trace, uh, trace bird. Is it a different one? Bird. Uh, <laughs> but like Ruby did awesome stuff with this like design here. And there's other crazy things that are in here. It's really worth learning. One that's interesting is closed gaps. When you export a vector from something like Inkscape or even Fusion 360, the vectors may be because of rounding error in, I'm going to blame it on JavaScript, the ends of those lines that are very close together, so close it doesn't matter on the laser or the vinyl plotter, they may not actually be overlapping and touching. And if that's the case, it blows the mind of vCard. And so closed gaps, it says, okay, any vectors that end within one one hundredth of a millimeter from each other, let's just close those, which is really important because a lot of its designs are based on what's inside of this continuous shape. And if the vectors are just close but not continuous, it can't define what's inside or outside of that. Yeah, it does happen. Yeah. And so those are things that like are actually pretty useful. But essentially what I've learned is every time I import something into vCarve, I hit close gaps no matter what. Doesn't, even though I think it's fine, I just hit close gaps because it's going to solve me problems later. Um, and you can import 3D models as well, but vectors are where you start. Um, here's just the toolpath side. This is the main feature of the software, but it's hidden by default. So you hit the toolpath tab and then you hit the little pin right here so it always stays open. Um, then there's a contour, a pocket, drilling. These are vCarve. Those are all things that were in the other software as well. So they're all the same. There's no words to describe them. You just have to guess from the pictures. The pictures are pretty okay, um, but you do that. I think this is the one that you used a ton, Ruby? Yes. The like yeah. picture to engraving? Yeah. And that was, can you quickly describe what you did with that? I made a picture. Um, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm sorry. Um, I took my image and I turned it into a series of lines uh, and you could change um, the intensity of it or you can change. I mean, I was doing like straight lines and then I would change the like angle of it, um, if that makes sense. But there's also a few different options where you can have your lines be like curvy or um, some other thing that I can't remember right now. Yeah. But this was my literal process in how I made the work. Um, I did um, this uh, engraving first, and then I ran through it with a pocket to get a flat surface. So I could then print it like a stamp, or it's called traditionally in printmaking a woodcut. Yeah, that's it. And they're and they're great. Um, another sort of more advanced concept that goes with here is roughing and finishing. The reason why those two things they're, they're both in pursuit of making this dome here. The reason why you'd rough something and then finish is you can do a roughing pass where you're really trying to hog out the material with a larger bit, maybe a half inch bit. So each time it goes by, it takes out a half an inch at a time. And then when you want to get to the detail work to get a nice smooth curve, um, you use like a, an eighth inch ball nose bit with a very tiny contact point. So it does a lot of little passes, but it doesn't need to remove a lot of material. Um, and so that's something that you might want to go into. And then save, this is a floppy disk for those of you that are not old enough to know what those are. Oh no. Sorry. Does that, did you, I mean, I'm, it's, it's a thing. It's going to happen. My high schoolers don't know what that shape is. No. Yeah, they don't. They're just like, that's a thing from a long time ago, right? <laughs> yeah. That's just the save icon. Yeah. Back when TV was black and white. That's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I oh. occupied my phone line to download my email. <laughs> I was happy for it. Yeah. Here's very much like um, Carbide Create. Here's your speeds and feeds. If you want to know more about speeds and feeds, here's a great video that will get you started in that direction from Haas, which right now is problematic um, a little bit, but it's fine. We can talk about their weirdness in a bit. But the um, company? Yeah, they are selling equipment to Russia still right now. Oh, it's complicated. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. But the video is good. So, okay. Whatever. <laughs> um, in any case, this is where you set all your speeds and feeds. You've got different tools. Your material can be set up. All, all of this works very much the same.
but you get a nice picture of what the tool looks like, which can actually be very helpful. Um, and you can put in notes. So this is another reason why you why a professional software stack might include this, because you can describe your tool um, in more. Well, we don't need to watch the video. Here's so you can preview your tool pass. This is fun. It does nice animations of the preview, which can be really helpful. So that's a roughing and then a finishing pass. You can see the roughing took out a lot of it, and then the finishing did the the rest. So it's really helpful to like see the process happen. Um, here's VCarve. If you have like these are the classic signs that people see, and that's what VCarve is meant to do. So that's from a ninety degree V bit, and it goes down at different depths to get the different thicknesses of those lines. So the actual blue lines there are really complicated shapes in order to get the shape of the font exactly how you want. And it's fascinating, actually. It's a lot of good math, but um, that's not the point of this. In any case, um, here's where your stuff goes together. You save your tool path, and you need to make sure you're using the right post processor every time in vCarve. There's some weirdness that makes it harder, but it, it is very useful. Um, so what should you do? You should. Go, go get started, make some things. You can do personalizations, you can make signs of your own. Uh, something like this is pretty easy to do actually, and they look really nice. Um, this is a photo of a decoration inside of 360 State across the street. It's literally a sheet of Baltic birch plywood that they just ran through a CNC machine. And I'm sure someone paid many, many hundreds of dollars for it. And, and good on that artist for selling it. That should have been me. This should have been you, Ruby. <laughs> it's, yeah. It looks weird, but it's just like a brown panel. And then in front of it is a sheet of plywood that they just cut out all of those weird holes with a CNC machine. So the tool is just sort of doing waves across the surface to get those circles to pop up. Um, and it looks great. Boat names are often CNC'd for the same reason. You can get all the detail you want. This is another type of CNC. If you really want, you can go find Open Desk online. They sell designs for furniture out of sheets of plywood, which is really cool. Although I've tried for years and haven't ever found them actually able to do that. Really? Sites like down. Well, they said that some of them are free, and then I, those I can't ever find. Oh. Which maybe it's that. Um, but yeah, it's that's that was their plan all along, I'm sure. But um, the big thing is go get badged on the Shapoko. You can install Carbide Create, you play around, you come in and you actually physically do a thing. Here's an example. Um, last year, Lisa, who's the jewelry facilitator now, she made this. Uh, this is the example of a cutting board that she made. These are just two by fours that she squared off and glued together and then used a different type of bit to make this well and tree cutting board. She actually made it out of a piece of wood that was like her grandfather's maybe, um, but it was very old. I like picked it up for her from Cleveland when I was coming back from the holidays. Oh, my it was it was very nice. Um, but it she made this so that she could carve, uh, you know, holiday turkeys and things on. So that's a plate. This is a cutting board. And so like a carving board for a bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you'd like set it here and then. Yeah, it's a it's a juice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all of these sort of drain off, and all your juice would go down here. Yeah, <laughs> this is the burn button. That's it. Found it. Yep. Um, yeah, so you can, we'll, we'll leave this. She used a different bit for that, um, but it's a neat so process. Easier. You can take a look. And the Shapoko is a nice, straightforward thing to do. If you want to level up, the Gerber is great. You can start to make things like this. My last school, I was in a teaching in a weird space. We decided we needed a table. I had a sheet of plywood. And so I designed that while sitting in an ice cream shop Heck eating yeah. ice cream and then made it in about 20 minutes of cutting. And we had a table all of a sudden. And it can be really, really helpful and useful. So, so Gerber question. Yeah, please. It's very big. It is. Um, if I needed mm -hmm. a new front door. Oh. <laughs> Hypothetical. Hypothetically. Yeah. Because uh, it's got cracks in it that let in. But anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. And like, could I theoretically just like. Yeah. Yes. Like, make, make a table? Yeah, I guess it is a table. It's not a table. I mean, right? a door. Yeah. Yes. But like, but yeah, no, that's a fair point. Like, but you could put weird elven stuff on it. You could put, you could put whatever. What... Shit on it. Yes. Elves. Absolutely. Yeah. Whatever design you wanted, you could do. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right.
You could. You're welcome. Yeah. I mean, my I don't have to edit myself out. So I yeah. Other, so you can do whatever you want to put on your door. It doesn't matter. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I thought like a fun, like. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. Know, like, it's all. You, yeah. yeah. But you could fit like. Oh yeah. The whole door on there. And Easy. Just, like, What's the max? It's like eight feet. It's it's actually a little over eight feet. Okay. Um. So Damn. it'll fit a Big full door. door. Yeah. Or you could do components and hardware that would. Yeah, yeah, you can do yeah. that. Too. My thought was that like I'll have to like get pieces and put them together, like sew them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very possible. Mm -hmm. The way that doors are typically made, you'll want to pay attention to though. They're often like framed on the sides with an inner panel that can expand and contract, which True. is the problem with your actual door that it didn't have that. Because I've seen it. Um, the and front door, not the side I, door. I, I know. Yeah. And it like. You have to think about the way that you construct it so that it can handle the seasonal movement. But yeah, we can make it super weird. Oh, see, yeah. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Make it out of like plastic. What? Yeah. Or see, see it out of the closet. Okay. Yeah. That it will not or like buy it or it. Good idea. bring it in here. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of ways. But where's the fun in that? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the problem is that. The, my current front door has these like three like insert pieces and all three of them have cracked just straight up the middle um okay yeah so it's just like in the winter you can just yeah. feel the freeze so, I think it's not that yeah is that um done with cnc machine or just regular yeah the the the, the question is were the legs done with the CNC or the saw? The legs were done with the CNC. And if we zoomed in, well, if I zoom in on this far too much, um, we can probably even see that they were um, made to click together. Oh, it's just plywood. So it's just plywood. It's, lost oh, yeah. OK, let me share the screen. Um, I was trying to get ready. It seemed like Julia was getting ready to share a screen. But in here, if you look real close, they're just plywood. And they're just sort of lined up together, and I got them close enough so I could sink a single screw in from either side, and they were going to hold. Um, the, the tables aren't perfectly not wobbly, but like it's one step above a card table, so it's fine. Um, and I made the table just like the reason why the table has these tapers is because the legs all have those tapers, and I could fit the leg next to the tabletop, and it would all fit nicely on one sheet of plywood. Um, so it was really just a game of trying to get it all to fit on one sheet of plywood more than anything. What about the cutouts? Those are handles just so you can, what about the cutouts? Those are handles so you can move it around easy. Um, you thought of everything. Well, it was a, it was to go in an adaptable classroom that was going to be changed all the time. Mm -hmm. So it needed to be ready to go. Cool. I actually made a second one at some point and it got like a branding labeled into the middle of it when I made it, which took like. The time to cut the branding in the middle of the table was equivalent to the time to actually cut out the rest of the table. So that's, you know, time is tricky. So good. Yep. Same is true for the Wacom table. The making the cutting the logo for the robot on the side was equal to the amount of time that it took to cut out the rest of the thing. So that's how, that's how it happens. How did you get the super sharp corners to get them split together if you can't do? Oh, um, if I keep the, how do I keep, how do I make them click together? They do have dog bones. And so let me keep zooming in on this. So those, uh, because it would only do a round, I just overcut it by a little so that there's a clearing for the thing to go into. Um, and it doesn't, I didn't have to round the piece of plywood. You could also have rounded the plywood to match. This is just cleaner because it comes off the robot ready to assemble. And you don't have to like manually hit it with a router afterwards. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna have a robot do 95% of the work. May as well have it finished. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's some sanding and some cleanup and those things that you can't avoid either way, but this way you don't have to figure out the assembly. Um, I wish I- While like when you say a bunch of detail on the surface, can you just like put it through the sander or the planer or something after that to clean the edges or? That's why Ruby did the pocket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. 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 But you totally can. Thank you. Um, there's even settings where you can say, like, take my entire design and start it down a tenth of an inch so that I can sand a tenth of an inch. Yeah. 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 But those all work. So. Yeah, there's tons. These are all good, more advanced things. Your first things, I promise you're not going to be thinking about this. You just want to like put the thing in the machine, go through the cycle, let it do its thing. And then later you'll get to the more advanced questions. Um, if you ever want to talk CNC, I'm way into it. We can do it all the time. There's also a book downstairs, um, a make, like make the brand, the brand. book uh, on CNC. how to make yeah, CNC furniture, I think it is. There's and, two or yeah. three, I they're, think. They're downstairs. great. Just Somewhere. go find them, flip through them. It's a good time. 